friends, and welcome to The World Transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. Happy Friday. How are you, my friend? Man, doing great. Glad to be here at the end of the week, and uh, got a good show tonight. Well, I asked for one thing, Stephen. I asked for freaking lasers on sharks, and you couldn't even... (laughs) I couldn't even give you that, right? I couldn't even so, give me that. But we're going to do a freaking laser show, which, uh, you know, that's, that's there, there's your uh, consolation prize, Bill. We're going to do, we're going to talk about lasers tonight. So. We, we, were, we were talking before we, as we were putting together ideas for the shows this week, and we got to talking about lasers, freaking lasers, Dr. Evil, that perhaps in his desire to do something truly dramatic and beautiful with lasers, that he missed some of their other potential, right? That, uh, <laughs> there, there could be other things that you do with lasers besides arm sharks. So, B- Besides uh, arming sharks with them. Because so when, when you think about it, sharks are pretty well armed anyway, right? The, yeah. the, idea, the idea of putting, uh, it would have made more sense to maybe put a laser <laughs> on a sea otter or something, right? I can, I can still understand his disappointment. You know, what do I pay you people for? You well, know, it's you... true. Uh, no, do- doctor. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole course in management around Doctor Evil and his and his people. I think there's 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 whole business books to be written about that. But sadly, we don't have time for that because we're going to talk about the laser side of it. And if we were on Doctor Evil's team, I think we'd be able to offer some pretty cool stuff with lasers. Uh, perhaps not the shark lasers, but how about this one? Lasers could make computers. One million times One faster. One million times faster. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something, Dr. Evil. A billion <laughs> operations per second isn't cool. No, you know what's cool? A million billion operations per second. You've got to hold the finger up to your mouth when you say that, right? That's a- <laughs> How many orders of magnitude have you increased uh, uh, at that point? Well, at least three, right? Yeah, um, you've, you've gone up four orders of magnitude when you when you increase it a, a million times. So that's a wow a lot. I mean, that's huge. Uh, I was just thinking. That in, in addition, uh, you're so you're you're getting that much more power out of a computer. I would guess that the heat, uh, the additional heat that you produce, would not would not be prohibitive. You could this could be done. This is in the realm of possibility. It would seem. Yes, the, the process for creating computing at this level is being tested in this piece. It's over on space.com. You can read about it. So this process is being tested, and apparently uh, it is being done in such a way that the heat is not prohibitive, although they're not actually doing computing with it yet. They are producing one zero binary operations, yes or no operations at that speed, the speed described here, a million billion operations per second, but they're not actually doing any calculations with it. So this is this is speculative this is speculative stuff, but it is fascinating in that they have found a way to potentially make computing work so much faster and they've done it using conventional processes. That is to say we're achieving what we would think of as quantum computer level results and this is this does involve a quantum process, but this is not quantum computing. This is plain old computing, um, manipulating Which, electrons and and basically getting a lot more bang for the buck in, in terms of what information you're taking from where they are. This is this is like the ultimate optimization of the electron for computing is is what we're seeing in in this story. The thing about uh, quantum computers is they are like amazing for cer- uh, a certain class of problems. But when, when if you, what you need is something that's a general computer that can solve general, uh, general problems, right, that does things that normal computers do, this is the way to go. And maybe ultimately one, one day you have a quantum computer sitting side by side with this so that you can solve all manner of problems. And, uh, you know, whether they be the quantum type problems that you'd use an actual quantum computer for, uh, things are a little less, a <laughs> little more run of the mill stuff. Uh, you still you'd, you'd use one of the, one of these computers that run so fast. Obviously, we're in the we're in the very early days of quantum computing, and it may be one day that we'll figure out how to use quantum computers for everything we currently use classic computers for, and we may, in time, abandon the classic computer model altogether. We don't know how we would do that currently. Right. Uh, that it doesn't seem like that would work, but there's an awful lot of computing power there. So you figure, well, we just don't know how to program the software to do it yet. But we're a long way from that. Quantum computers require, in, in this day and age, some pretty exotic materials and exotic conditions. And 
and it's hard to make this happen. Now, what we're talking about here with this using laser light pulses to drastically increase the, the rate of computing, that's not simple stuff, but it's a pretty straightforward projection on top of technology that we already have. The proof of concept of this is just basically building on te laser technology that already exists, computing technology that already exists. In Eureka, you've got this million-fold increase in how much processing power you're able to generate. Also, interestingly, because it does rely on a quantum process, these researchers say that this technique could be used for quantum computing, and if it were done, it would happen at room temperature. But they haven't done that yet, so we're not... That is like... This is sort that's, of speculative. That's theoretical then, on top of theoretical. It's, exactly, you know. exactly. We're speculating yeah. on top of speculation. So we'll, we'll stop with the first one because you know what? A million times faster is good enough for today, right, for this Friday. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll pick it Absolutely. up next week and, and, and see what else they, they, they can come up with. But you think about, we were talking on Monday about all the wonderful potential applications of carbon nanotubes. What are the wonderful potential applications of being able to compute a million times faster. What do you think, Stephen? Makes, Anything comes It makes around? everything. You know, I, I keep bringing up this example. You, you asked me one time, what superpower do we want? And superintelligence is the superpower we want because every other power follows, right? I mean, uh, you want to be super strong? You want to have the power of flight? Give me superintelligence and I'll figure it out, right? I'll be Iron Man, right? And the great thing about processing a million times faster, if you can be dumb, right, <laughs> If you, if you can go through a really clunky thought process a million times faster, effectively you're smarter, right? Even though you're exactly, yeah, yeah. The, the, this even if we're not thinking nearly as smart as we could, even if we're not nearly as intelligent as we could, but you can brute force intelligent solutions when you're going a million times faster. It's a, it's an amazing boost. Well, let's just let's just say that that I was gonna you know gonna give you a life that's a million times longer. Think of all the things that you could accomplish in a life that's a million times longer than the one you're expecting right now. Right. 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 Uh, well, that's kind of what you're doing for a computer, right? You're you're allowing it to compute a million times longer, in essence, if you make it a million times faster. So, what do we get when we get computers that are a million times uh, more powerful than what we have right now? And that's what you're talking about when you say they're faster by that. You know, you're making them that much more powerful. Well, who knows? Everything gets better, right? We, it's, it's something that can, it, it can be applied to every problem that we have. And so, yeah, it's, 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 that's huge. That's huge. You, you think about things like our communication networks, they become that much more resilient. Probably we can make much, much better use of power than we're currently able to make. And we think about forward-looking Applications actually not that forward-looking anymore. These are these are real-world applications that are only going to become more important, such as autonomous vehicles. You think, right. well, there's there's risks with autonomous vehicles. We've been talking about wrecks. We've been talking about people being killed. What if the computers in the autonomous vehicles could operate even ten times faster? Right. Elon Musk has said that the problem of autonomous vehicles is basically a solved problem. We're just working around the edges right now to make it better. Well, I mean, if you can make it even 10 times faster, those computers, then uh, you take a problem that's essentially solved already. But, you know, you make these things almost crash-proof, I mean, at that point. And certainly fatal crash-proof is obviously what you're, what you're sh shooting for with something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, even, even the systems we have today, I think it, it, it would take something well short of a million times faster to make them <laughs> basically crash-proof, right, to make them right. basically as as safe as we could ever ask for. So computing a million times faster, pretty awesome. And in fact, here's one of the potential applications for it. Shows up a little bit deeper in this story. Stimulating brains with lasers can create matrix-like false experiences. Let me just read the beginning of this. At the University of California, Berkeley, researchers have been busy exploring ways to project a holographic image directly into the brain. As they have discovered, this can be used to both read neural activity and also to stimulate it. Just I, I want to mention in passing, because we didn't talk about this, and th there's actually sort of a similarity here. Lasers are kind of the carbon nanotubes of light, when you think about it, you know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. They, they, they take light, which is already an extremely useful thing, and they make it even more useful, right? They, they open up all these, all of these new possibilities. So it's like, wow, you can shine a laser into someone's brain, actually project a holographic image, potentially into their brain. Now, 
Now, it's not like you put a picture in the brain just because you're showing a picture. Obviously, it would have to be encoded differently because it's not going into the eye. It's going, it's going into the brain. Uh, as the story goes on here, the results could mean one day being able to activate or suppress thousands of neurons at once, copying patterns of real brain activity to trick the brain into thinking that it's felt, seen, or sensed something. So Star Wars with a touch of the Matrix or Inception as the author of this piece likes to put it. And what's interesting here is, although that application is implied in this piece, these researchers are actually working on something else. They're working on brain disorders. They're working on shooting these laser beams into brains in order to quell the kind of brain activity you see associated with epilepsy or schizophrenia. Basically, just kind of sorting the brain out when it's, when it's going in a bad direction, which clearly is a huge potential application and something that would be almost incredibly beneficial. And, and they're talking about opening up a whole new class of neural prosthetics of being able to address all of these different kinds of problems. And although it's not mentioned here that I can see, you think about the neurodegenerative stuff like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, there's probably a good application for that kind of stuff there. You, you can imagine like uh, the, the Star Trek uh, technology of Geordi's visor. Well, how, how's that supposed to work? Well, Geordi's visor is obviously patched straight into the brain, and perhaps perhaps it's lasers that are producing holographic images of what he needs to see, right? Maybe the, uh, this is a real-world explanation for how that fictional technology would work. But, uh, man, that's, that's, that's awesome. I'm glad you mentioned Jordy and his visor first because it's Friday and we have to geek out a little bit, but also a little bit. because that's a, that's a really good image of what they're talking about here. When they talk about neural prosthetics, they specifically talk about patients who've lost function of their retinas or other sense organs, and you can just bypass all that, right? You actually right. put a camera on their head and boom, you, you, you can pipe the visual information directly into the brain. That is what they're talking about doing here. And from there, when, once you look at that piece, you go, well, what if, Instead of a camera showing what's happening in real time, what if you hooked up a VR system, right? What if you hooked up a game and you could pump visual information from another source directly in? And that's where you get the matrix kinds of applications. But since we're working in the brain here, and as they describe here, we're, t we're talking about all of the different activity that goes on in the brain. So instead of just feeding just visual information, they can feed visual information, audio information, and also tactile information. One of the big missing pieces of virtual reality as it's being discussed today is all of the ability to touch, right? It's hard you to know do. that wearing a glove is just like feeling things in the real world. Right? You know, it's not. I mean, the, the, the touch thing lags way behind the rest of it. The, speaking of lags, one of the big problems with VR is a bit of a perceptual lag in terms of all that processing power required to create that world, things tend to work a little bit slower than they do in, in the real world. And even if it's so slow that you can't even consciously see it, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a strain on your system. It wears you out to be operating at a speed other than, than the speed you're currently working at. But if they're pumping information directly into the brain, that probably does away with that lag. And we're talking about a technology here that speaks to true full immersion virtual reality maybe we're talking about total recall technology maybe yeah. that's what you know if, if we're using sci-fi as our <laughs> as our basis maybe it's, it's something a little more akin to that uh, you know you can implant memories so you can you, you can implant memories but you can also implant live potentially live experiences which seems to right. be what's happening in total recall anyway right right the, we seem to be seeing more than somebody just remembering something, right? It, it all looks like it's happening, which is, I guess, what makes it interesting as a movie. <laughs> if it had just been memories, there, would, there wouldn't yeah, be a lot of little, action. Yeah, true. You, know, you have a guy go, hey, I suddenly remember things. Let me describe my memories. But, but the idea is where the interface would be the brain itself, right? Rather than the computer talking to a visor or speakers or a haptic suit, it's going straight to the brain and giving you that experience in real time. And just to kind of tie it all together, you know what would really, really push a process like this along? Computers that go a million times faster, don't you think? So, <laughs> to go. Well, it's, it's exciting stuff. I, it's one of the things, actually, I, I look at this story and I say, this is one of the things I've been looking for. It's like the, the cutting next edge of VR is how do we get VR into the brain? Because that's when, that's when we face a really interesting future where we're able to create truly 
equivalent subjective experiences to what we experience in the real world. And not only does this speak to that technology coming along, this is not that technology, but it speaks to it coming at some point in the future, it also provides a pathway for that technology to be developed because they're not talking about entertainment. They're not talking about virtual reality. They're talking about treating serious conditions. They're talking about helping people with epilepsy, helping people with... With blindness, uh, yeah, or blindness, yeah, neurodegenerative exactly. diseases, yeah, schizophrenia, the whole the whole gamut of conditions that this can potentially treat. You know, you look at it and say, well, even if they don't get the VR out of it, this is definitely something to push on with, and we can only look forward to what the results of that research will be. So there you have it: the carbon nanotubes looking good, lasers looking very good. Glad we were able to, uh, and of course, uh, sports analytics, also an important technology. This has been a fun week, and we're going to be back next week with three brand new shows talking about a topic we haven't decided yet. So tune in. We look forward to having you all with us then. And until next time, live to see it.